I'm delighted to be with you and to have a chance to speak to you about my work on measuring social change. As we begin, I'd like you to put in your mind a key global challenge that you care about. Could be climate change, could be global health pandemics, global poverty, racial justice and inequality. Pick one in your mind. Now imagine an organization that's actually trying to address this problem. It could be an organization, a nonprofit to which you've donated money. It could be a business with a social purpose. It could be a government agency whose work you follow. Now put yourself in the shoes of a manager or a leader within that organization. How will you understand whether you're actually delivering on the results that you're seeking to achieve? How will you measure and improve that progress? This turns out to be one of the most difficult challenges facing social change leaders. And it's the purpose of my new book, Measuring Social Change, which came out last year, and we're gonna have a Spanish version coming out in the fall. The central question that many managers of social change organizations ask is, how do we know if we're making a difference? And their funders ask the same question. How do they know if they're making a difference? So whether you are an advocacy organization, like the top image on this slide, um, advocating for the rights of marginalized groups, or if you're a soup kitchen serving meals to the homeless, or a food systems organization working with smallholder farmers, it's the same question that you have to ask as a manager or as a funder. The stakes are high. So just in the US alone, nonprofit organizations generate about $2 trillion of revenue on an annual basis. And in the business world, the impact investing community, which is about 10 years old, has already generated about half a trillion dollars of assets under management, which is growing rapidly. But even these kinds of figures are not enough to address our social challenges. According to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, we're seeing a shortfall of about $3 trillion annually in terms of the resources needed to actually address big social sustainable development challenges like ending poverty or hunger or creating gender equality. So for organizations to generate the resources, to generate trust in society to provide those resources, and to measure progress, the challenge for managers is to actually develop clear strategies for social change. In my work, I identify three foundational questions that any manager or leader must ask. The questions will seem obvious to you, but the answers turn out to be more difficult to produce. So the first one, most obviously, is what is it that we're trying to achieve? And the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche is known to have said, the most common form of human stupidity is forgetting what we were trying to accomplish. We get so caught up in the day to day that we lose sight of the big goals and actually measuring progress towards those. In the language of management, that's your value proposition. We need to be clear about what we're trying to achieve and for whom we're trying to achieve those goals. The second foundational question that any manager must address is how will we bring about that change? In the language of social change management, that's your social change model. And we have a whole set of tools and methods that can help us to achieve an answer to this question. And then third, there's this question of how will we hold our feet to the fire? This is the issue of accountability in terms of delivering on that value proposition. So any leader of a social change organization must be very clear about these, the answers to these three questions. And in turn, their teams, their staff, their constituents must be aligned around those answers. In my research, I found, however, that even if you're clear about the answers to these three questions, you still need to do a lot more work in terms of developing a clear strategy how you will actually go about delivering that change. And I've identified four key types of strategy that I think are pretty comprehensive in terms of the options facing 
managers. So I'm going to list for you the four types of strategies. I'm not going to have time to go into all of them, so I'm going to focus on two of them. There's a niche strategy where you deliver a key service with high quality, such as meals in a soup kitchen. There's an integrated strategy where you line up a whole set of interventions. So in a food system, if you're working with smallholder farmers, you might line up access to credit and fertilizers with irrigation, with access to markets, in order to then increase farmer incomes. In an emergence strategy, which I find is very common among advocacy organizations, you have to take stock of the political environment and constantly adapt your strategy, your approach, in order to be able to move the needle on the policy problem you're addressing. And that changes rapidly over time. So you need to be nimble and agile. And finally, in an ecosystem strategy, you might decide that actually addressing the problem requires partnership, coordination, among a whole range of organizations working together. So the soup kitchen by itself can't address the problem of homelessness. It needs to work with a whole bunch of others. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about these two strategies, the niche and the ecosystem, with a focus on one organization to illustrate it. That organization is called Miriam's Kitchen. It works with the homeless and it's based in Washington, DC. Now Miriam's Kitchen initially started off with a niche strategy, which is perfectly appropriate for the kind of emergency service work that it was doing. It was providing highly focused services, meals, clothing, transportation to other facilities, connection to organizations that could provide shelter. And it was doing this with high quality. Now, if you're a leader in such an organization, what could you reasonably measure and take credit for? It turns out that all you can actually take credit for is short-term results or outputs, the number of people fed or sheltered and so on. In some instances, that's perfectly appropriate. But in other instances, you might ask the question, well, is this enough to address the problem that you're after? About a dozen years ago, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a piece, an article in the New Yorker magazine, which he was following a man, a homeless individual that he called Murray. He asked the question, what is the cost to society of keeping Murray in the condition that he's in? We're not really getting him out of homelessness. Is there a cost to us? And if you tallied these up, the emergency room visits, the interactions with the police, the emergency shelter, Murray was costing society about $100,000 a year, or about a million over a decade, hence the name Million Dollar Murray. And so one has to ask the question, is there a better way? We're spending all of this money, and in the end, Murray is no better off than he was before. Well, it turns out, yes, there's a better way for actually a lot less money, a lot less cost to society. It requires a fundamental shift in our thinking from a niche strategy, which takes the client, Murray in this instance, provides all of these services, but Murray has, has, is left to kind of figure out which ones to pursue and how to find those services. Those are niche services. They're not coordinated in a way that actually helps him. But could we move to an ecosystem strategy for addressing this problem in a much more orchestrated, integrated kind of way? Turns out there's a solution. It's called Housing First. It was pioneered by an organization called Pathways to Housing in New York City. And the idea is you take the most vulnerable people like Marie, you put them in housing, and then you wrap all of these services around them so they can be customized to the needs of that individual. It sounds expensive, but it turns out to be a lot cheaper than the atomized niche services way in which this work was previously done. If you're a manager or a funder, what could you measure now in terms of progress? Well, you'd measure those individual services. Are they provided effectively, efficiently? But now you can actually get at the collective result, the collective outcome of actually getting people out of chronic homelessness. And this, this uh, more ecosystem-oriented strategy turns out to be twice as effective as a niche orientation. It turns out that this framing, niche strategies and ecosystem strategies, apply to all sorts of other types of problems. So addressing the coordination problems in a global health pandemic 
requires us to actually work together and coordinate it as an ecosystem rather than acting alone. Addressing climate change requires an ecosystem strategy. Addressing poverty requires an ecosystem strategy. So you might ask why we don't actually see more of such types of efforts. That's a topic for a much longer conversation, but two of the key reasons are, A, this requires particular skills of negotiation, conflict resolution, working together, rather than trying to take credit for separate work that we do alone. And B, it's actually a lot harder to raise funding for this kind of work because nobody can take credit for the results on their own. So to begin to wrap up, in my book, I lay out four different types of strategies that social change leaders can pursue. And I've talked about two of them briefly, the niche and the ecosystem strategies. But it's possible to be high performing in any of these four strategies. And as a manager, you've got to choose because that then affects what you can reasonably measure and be held to account for and the kinds of performance management systems that you might build. In closing, I'd like to say a few words about what's happening at Tufts in this space. Tufts University is a leader on social change work and particularly at the ecosystem strategy level. So just in the past year, there's been a whole set of convenings. Fletcher had a convening on the Arctic. So just think about the challenges confronting us in the Arctic, climate change, navigable waters, um, geopolitics, access to natural resources, and so on. In addition, there's another whole group at Fletcher that's working on the digital economy and asking the question, what would a digital economy look like if it were inclusive, if it were actually benefiting everybody in society? But what makes me most proud is the work of our students. So the three logos that you see at the bottom of this screen are startup organizations that were founded by tough students who graduated last year. All of them took a class with me where we developed strategies for their organizations. And I wanna close with an email I received from the founder of the first of these, Sustag for All, which is a sustainable agriculture organization working with smallholder farmers uh, on food systems in Colombia. And the founder of that organization is Luis Villegas. He graduated last year. And he sent me an email a few weeks ago as I was preparing for this talk. And he wrote to me, the 1,000 avocado trees are planted and are looking in great shape. The seedlings facility will sell the first 40,000 seedlings by the end of the year 2020. Last year, I attended the Climate Action Summit at the UN headquarters representing the Fletcher School. Amongst so many high-level meetings and networking, I had the chance to present Sustag for All to the Secretary General and asked him to include us as one of the projects in the Year of Action on the Global Commission on Adaptation. Sustag for All represents what the Fletcher community, and I might add Tufts University, pursues. We are being seen as an example for Fletcher and Friedman School entrepreneurs of the way to make big changes. It has a huge value for it's something to feel proud of. Now that makes me proud to be a part of Tufts University. Thank you. How wonderful. Thank you so much, Alnor, for that wonderful presentation. So happy to be with you, you almost that. live, almost together. Um, so thank you, thank Delighted you so much. <laughs> Um, so I do have a quick question. The questions are coming in and everyone keep them soaring in. We're, we're blowing through them very quickly here, but I wanted to start very quick, briefly with the question to you, Alnor, about strategy. I'm very interested, as you know. Um, you've told us that an ecosystem strategy, although expensive to put in place, is twice as effective as a niche strategy would be. However, we don't see more of these types of efforts because A, it requires particular skills in negotiation, as you mentioned, and conflict resolution and working together. Um, but B, it's a harder to raise funding for these types of organizations because nobody can take credit for the results on their own. Um, you say this is a topic for a much larger conversation, but can you give us one example of, of that and, and what that would look like and how we might overcome those challenges? Yes, of course. Um, so the, the homeless example that I gave um, in the talk 
This is national. So it's not just Miriam's Kitchen in Washington, DC, but there are literally hundreds of cities experimenting with this model. And in some cases, city level government, municipal governments have stepped up and are taking the lead on this. And so in some cases it's nonprofits, in some cases it's city government. But the whole idea is you can't just have a soup kitchen trying to address homelessness. You have to get the soup kitchen with the substance abuse counseling folks, with the healthcare folks, with the employment folks, all working together. And you need some sort of coordination mechanism for doing that. But if I can give another example, um, we're just later this week, actually on, on Thursday and Friday of this week, we're convening at Tufts at the Tisch College, a group of community foundation leaders. Um, and a, about four of them are gonna be talking about their works, um, their efforts to address racial justice and inequality in their communities. So the Greater Buffalo Community Foundation, uh, Dubuki, uh, San Francisco, um, you know, Greater Flint with the water crisis, really using these opportunities to say, here's a community foundation that's embedded in the community. It's got networks upwards with all of its funders and it's got networks laterally and downwards with communities, with nonprofits, and it can actually serve as a hub for coordinating, for getting people to do joint action, to pick one or two big problems and to give it everything that they've got. And so imagine in this country, we've got about 800 community foundations. If they were all doing this kind of work, we would have incredible results on moving the needle on big social problems. Well, it's amazing, Alnor, that you say this because it feels like Tufts and the, through the work specifically that you're doing is helping to sort of incent even some of these, what we might call niche organizations to really come together. I mean, I guess that was one of the questions that has been coming up both through the chats and please everyone continue to ask your questions. Um, but one of the questions is how can we get or how do we incent these sort of niche organizations to take on these ecosystem strategies? You know, how do we actually bring them together? I recognize Tufts as a convener, but are there other ways to do that? Yes, indeed. And I think, I think communities are willing to come together if they can agree on a problem that they want to solve. And so the convener role, the honest broker role can be partly about saying, look, as a community, what is one or two challenges we want to address? And then who would we have to line up in order to be able to do this? So this can be played by nonprofits. Businesses, I think, have a huge role here. So the sustainable development goals, ending hunger, ending poverty, ending gender inequality, um, none of this is gonna happen without a major role for business. So we need business to step up. And Tim mentioned this earlier in his comments to say, you know, I might be, a soft drink maker, um, you know, or a maker of uh, electronics, but I actually want to contribute to my community and to build goodwill in my community. I can bring resources to the table. Who else is willing to come and work on an issue that we care about, whether it's human rights, gender rights, clean water, such as the work of the Community Foundation in Flint or so on. Great, thank you. Actually, I'm just getting another one. I'm trying to flush through all these questions. It's great, keep them coming folks. But there, here's one uh, that came from an audience member. Systemic is systemic, I should say, is a buzzword that's increasingly used in the impact world. How can managers incorporate strategies to measure systemic issues? Yes, this is a really good question and a very difficult one. So the- Yeah. The problem is not in measuring progress on the problem. So let's say that you want to end urban poverty or you want to close the racial achievement gap. That's actually pretty measurable. Or you actually want nobody to get sick from the COVID pandemic. This is measurable. We can, we can measure all of these things. And in fact, you know, the CDC measures sort of, you know, rates with respect to the pandemic, um, homelessness and so on. So actually seeing whether the needle is moving on the problem or not is not the problem. The problem, the challenge is getting everybody to have a coordinated strategy for it. And so what's hard about that is everybody wants to do their bit and they take credit for solving the problem, but it doesn't work that way. We need to actually work together and give credit to one another for actually solving the problem. So if we can take ego out of it and say, here's what we can bring to the table to contribute, then we might actually be able to make progress on this. 
I do think that the pandemic has made very clear that governments have a huge role to play here in terms of taking the separate atomized actions of different cities, different communities, different organizations and saying, no, we can help to coordinate this work. We can bring resources to bear to coordinate this work because only then will we see actually a decline in rates of illness from the pandemic. Very important point, you know, that the import of both private sector, but also government and really solving some of these issues. Thank you. You know, we've gotten a couple of questions around this niche strategy and you know, the idea that, yes, the ecosystem strategy is where we want to go. Um, but there have been a couple of questions, so I'm going to morph them a little bit, if I may. Um, let me just say it this way. Many organizations, they're saying, are hitting a wall, if you say, um, when attempting to assess their impact on the larger scale societal issues, as we've described, which is why you really wanted to bring that ecosystem strategy to bear. But one, you know, how do we suggest that those niche organizations get over that as individual organizations? And two, are there still organizations that are better served by continuing to use niche strategy um, in the way that they approach their work? Yes, um, thank you for that question. It's a very astute one. And so I'm not suggesting that all organizations move to an ecosystem strategy. The four strategies that I outlined in the book um, I think each of them one can be high performing in, but you have to be clear about what you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to end homelessness, a soup kitchen won't do it. Um, you know, if you're trying to solve the pandemic, just working on getting people to wear face masks is not going to do it. It's a key ingredient, but by itself is not sufficient. On the other hand, there are certain niches that we feel actually you should stay focused on and do well. So for example, take you know, ambulance services. Um, you know, God forbid, because there's 800 people sort of watching this conversation between us, right? If I had a cardiac event, right? My heart starts beating faster um, and I fall to the floor. My wife who's in the room below me will hear a thump. She's gonna come running up, she's gonna call 911. My chances of survival are much, much higher if the ambulance responds and administers care within nine to 12 minutes. If they respond in a half hour, my chances are very slim. What would we expect that ambulance service to measure? It would be unreasonable, it would be crazy to expect them to measure my health outcome because they're gonna pick me up, they'll administer emergency care, they'll take me to the hospital. And you know this as somebody that's in the health field yourself. What Absolutely. we expect the ambulance service to measure is response time and quality of care delivered en route. Those are short-term measures. That's a niche service. We don't want the ambulance service to be doing 10 different things or coordinating 10 different things. We want them to be doing a focused task, highly focused that they can deliver with high quality. That's a niche service, it has real value. Another example is, you know, if you've been through sort of the standard American education system, you've gone from daycare um, or preschool slash daycare to elementary school to middle school to high school and perhaps to vocational or college. Um, each of these is a niche. So Tufts University is a niche and there's a handoff across these. And we've got a, for most, actually for not for most, for some people, there's a pretty good handoff that enables you to move through these niches so that you actually got an ecosystem that's working. But that system is failing a lot of people, right? People that don't have somebody that can help them um, make use of their preschool and elementary school, or people that have guidance counselors that can help them make the transition, or don't have the resources to make the transition. So an organization like Harlem Children's Zone in New York City actually thinks about that entire pipeline, that entire continuum, and tries to provide services along the way so that people don't fall through the cracks. They're saying that that educational system works for some part of our society, but for a lot of folks in those 100 city blocks in Harlem, it's not working. So we actually need a much more integrated strategy for those. Well, Elmer, I will say, and Dr. Ibrahim, I should say, I will say uh, your work is so powerful and I appreciate so much the time that you've taken this evening to share it with us. I know that the work that you'll be doing this weekend to bring together the community foundations will be incredibly successful. And I look forward to hearing how that goes, especially when it comes to racial equity. So thank you so very much, Dr. Ibrahim.